point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Gentlemen, welcome to Energy Week with George Harvey. Let me, me. Let, me let me quit. Let me set the clock. Ah, and the amazing <laughs> okay. Tom Fennell, who is setting the clock in the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> I want to start out with um, an announcement. Oh, an announcement. An I announcement. said I was going to do this last week, and now I'm here. announcing that I'm going to do it next week. Oh, you're going to do it next week. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do it next week. Um, the 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 powers that be for the time being. And oh, I think you mentioned this. Hopefully only for the time being in Washington, D.C. have decided that the, the um, cable companies which get free uh, material to broadcast to people should, should, can, can charge yeah, the, the public access television stations. I mean, after stations. all, I mean, you know, they deserve it, don't they? Yeah, right. <laughs> they're getting the material for free, but they're going to charge the public access stations well, that, to that, carry that, it. But that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So Tom and I put in a lot of time on this on this program every week. I, I spend about 32 or so hours a week on my blog. And then in addition to that, I've got five or six hours a week. And I don't know how many hours you spend, but it's got to be eight. Eight, eight, eight to twenty, ten. Eight, eight to ten, yeah, something yeah. like that. It's and, a good you know, amount. here we are, and all of a sudden we've got a bill coming up that we have to pay in order to keep this this um, program coming, which we're going to do one way or another. Anyway, um, it happens that in addition to writing about a hundred articles a, a month, uh, a year on energy for Clean Technica and and Green Energy Times, and keeping my blog daily which I've been doing for six years, and actually 14 months before that by email instead of yeah, a blog. Yeah, but this is what you love. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, I, I figured out early on that, that you can get a lot of traction out of the fact that you're always there. Yeah, you know, yeah. and reliable. Re reliable is really important. And um, uh, basically what, what happens is that in addition to all the other stuff, I've been writing fiction. Yeah, right, right. So I've got some... Uh -huh. I've got some here comes the commercial, Here guys. comes the commercial. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everybody to donate to BCTV. I'm going to start this next week because I've got to f get the details all filled, figured out with the p powers that be here. And anybody who donates 20 bucks or more, I'm going to give one of my books to. Sounds like a plan. And the, and the, the book I'm going to start with is this one. At the Pearly Gates. At the Pearly Gates. It's a little bitty book of, of micro shorts. I'm actually going to read one. Uh, what's a good one to read? These are all the little gems that you've collected. <laughs> little They're gems. Written. They're yeah. all original? Yeah, well, they're, actually, yes, they are. Except for the first one, which is just something I wrote that was based on an on a old story in Germany. I'm going to read this entire chapter. <laughs> Uh, this is chapter to look 20, or story 20. <laughs> These are micro shorts, and you'll find out why as I read this. This is called The Farmer on the Knoll. God let my house burn down. What kind of God would let my house burn down? You've got to remember, we're at the pearly gates here. You built your house on the top of a no grassy knoll in Kansas, and you didn't install a night lightning rod. Uh oh He burned my barn down and took all my animals. What kind of God would do that? The barn didn't have a lightning rod either. You should have known a grassy knoll is a dangerous place in a lightning storm. Mrs. Albright taught you all about it in second grade. It's not fair. My life had no meaning at all. Actually, that's not entirely true. A lot of people saw you die. The whole fire department was there. It was quite a picture. One moment you're standing alone on a grassy knoll, starkly silhouetted against flashes of lightning, shaking your fist at the sky and cursing God like a character in a romantic no novel. The next morning, zap, you're totally blitzed. Every church in town will be packed for months. <laughs> this, is based, this is based on a true story. My, my uncle Charlie, t was, when he was about 13 years old, was permitted to be a member of the of the volunteer fire department in I think it was Plattsmouth, Nebraska, 
and he saw exactly that happen. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Mm, wow. Anyway, that's, that's Micro Shorts. This is a th seriously thick book of um, short stories called Lives Lost and Found. There's 20 short stories in there. This is a play called um, Gaining the Past, which is a play about how and why Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching. Oh, cool. It is a farce, as all Taoist <laughs> writing, good Taoist writing is. Um, and finally, notes from the American Association for Prevention of Cruelty to Wee Folk. Ah, oh, you got the Wee Folk I got the Wee Folk Good. In yeah. Good. And um, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> I was get, I'm going to work something out, but the, the, the thing that I'm considering is that the first 24 people who, um, who donate $20 to support Energy Week, I'll give them a copy of, um, of uh, the, At the Pearly Gates. Okay. And, and um, you know, the, the idea there is if I, can, if I can come up with 24 copies of this going out, which is not a huge expense to me, BCTV will get $480, and that would cover the cost for a year of, show. of this show. And then after that, if there's more going out, you know, um, we can figure out what, what to do about that, but I'd like to be able to support other people. And by the way, this is not just a problem for BCTV. It's a problem for every public access television station in the country. They all yes, have to yes, pay yes. to get the yes. materials that they put together for well, look, free. How else are you going to support a tax cut for the rich? Oh, man, <laughs> I'll tell you. I mean, you know, it's very essential. Well, we've got a, we've got a government which is designed... To, to make sure that people who can make a lot of money can make as much money as possible, and that people who don't make a lot of money, much, um, money don't get any extra, because who cares? Yeah, right. You know, I have they a theory. They don't donate much to campaigns. <laughs> yeah, right. I have a theory of economics, which is called the trickle-up theory. Trickle-up theory. Theory yeah. of economics. It's not original. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> anyway, um, every day, I get up, and uh, today I was actually up at about 2 o'clock because I woke up and couldn't get back to sleep. And I do my uh, energy blog, which is called geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. And uh, the energy blog has in it 10 to 15 articles, each represented by a synopsis with a link to the original article. And um, you can go to the blog, and we will be talking about what has happened in the past week, today being the 30th of May, it will will be starting on the 23rd. So, we'll so this doing, is the best of the blog. This is the best of the blog. We'll have mm. about 20 or 21 stories usually each week. And yeah, it's about three a day. Yeah. And about right, right about now, I usually pipe up and I say something like, uh, obviously I've read all of these before yeah. beforehand and some of them are well worth reading yourself and I'll try and call your attention to it. Yeah. You know, because as I say, some of them are interesting. Yeah. Well, heck, heck, some of them are, are such that we could we could run a whole show just we, on you one You know, of them. there's one that we have this week yeah. that I found extremely interesting and it's only three paragraphs long. Okay, I we'll, think we'll, I remember that one. There was no information on. There's it. almost no information, <laughs> but the you know it just says what it says in a very sh simple terms. And if you say to yourself, "Wait a minute, what's going on here?" <laughs> um, it I'll have to I'll point it out when we we'll, get to it. We'll, I don't remember we'll, which one. We'll it notice it because I, yeah. I don't have much to say about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> Good. So anyway, um, I, maybe we should just start. We're on the 23rd yeah, we of got May. A, we got a if you go to the blog. Up. If you go to the blog, you can find the articles for the 23rd of May by clicking on the calendar for the 23rd of May and the article. How clever. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever article it is will be among the, the, um, the ones that you get up. Okay. Our we're going to start off with some cowboys today. Cowboys, yeah. Well, this is from Green Tech Media. It's an interesting coincidence. These are Wyoming cowboys. Yeah. And as, as I almost identically to the time I'm... Doing, I'm looking over this. I'm listening to Vermont Public Radio. Yeah. And they're talking about for the very first time, cowboys from Hawaii took the rodeo away from cowboys from Wyoming. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, there's not supposed to be any cowboys in Hawaii, but Actually, apparently there are some good ones. No, there there are good ones, and they have cattle ranches in Hawaii. Oh and yeah, that's they why do they've quite got a bit, cowboys. Which is what the story was all about. Yeah. What do you got for a title here? U.S. Wind Industries' response to solar's rise. Embrace it. 
Amid the changes going on in renewable energy industries, the American Wind Energy Association trade group announced that its flagship annual wind power conference and exhibition will expand to include solar and storage batteries. Well, that's kind of natural. They're going to they're going to do that starting in in um, next year in Denver. Well, a quick takeaway here: onshore wind is the largest and cheapest source of renewable power in the U.S. today. Mm -hmm. Okay, but solar's catching up quickly, as we <coughs> know from watching this show. Absolutely. Solar's catching up yep. very quickly. But here's the point. The best places to build wind farms in the U.S. are far from population centers. Yes. Okay, so getting the power to the population centers through transmission lines is difficult. Yeah. But since you can locate a solar power, solar center almost anywhere, that's not a problem. Yes, absolutely. Okay, our next item is from WCBE 90.5 FM. Sounds like a radio station. It sounds like it probably <laughs> is. It is from Ohio. Ohio House lawmakers amend nuclear plant bailout bill. This is kind of crazy. They, they had a, the House passed this yesterday. Yeah, they passed it. The, the Ohio House has dramatically changed the energy bill that would bail out the state's nuclear power plants and repeal renewable energy standards. There's a, there's a backstory here. Oh, we yes, know that. indeed. Under the changes, neither wind nor solar power can qualify for clean air credits. It seems the bill only benefits nuclear plants. And by the way, one of the sources I read on this said those nuclear plants are not losing money. So they're going to be giving a they're giving money, subsidy to yeah. plants that are not losing money because well, they probably will lose money in the future. Nuclear power has been subsidized from the beginning. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's being subsidized big time now. And of course, what are they what are they cutting out of the subsidies? They're cutting out solar and wind. Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Because they it, don't, it, it, you can't make money selling fuel to solar and wind farms. Bingo. <laughs> That's the bottom line. I mean, <clears throat> people people aren't really talking much about that, but the 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 future is coming. Yeah. And in the future it's going to be considered ridiculous to pay for fuel. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we got another, another nice picture here. This, we do. this, this one's a little, a, nice bit, a little bit weird here. A little bit weird. Let's pull that one up. Yeah, let's let's do that. <laughs> That's a mandarin another, duck. You got another click. Yeah, I got another click. I'm not away. a mandarin duck. That's, there we go. Sometimes this, it, you, you make me wonder. <laughs> <laughs> when it's raining out, sometimes I tell people. Well, it, there's a mandarin duck, but it's it's upside down. Well, the head is upside down. <laughs> the body is right side up. It's it's. It's doing something with its feathers or checking for... Yeah. Well, okay, this, this is an is interesting article. Well, article from The Guardian. Republicans aren't just climate deniers. They deny the existing extinction crisis, too. And yeah. this is this kind of scary. This is. In King Lear, Lear, this is obviously a Shakespearean play, there is a famous line, quote, "'Tis time's plague when ma madmen lead the blind." End quote. The words comment on the deadly sequences, uh, consequences rather, of greed, delusion, and folly, but they could serve just as well as a comment on today's Republican Party. Well, it's an interesting article. Yeah. I mean, one, of, one of the ones I think you'll enjoy looking at. The Republican officials and their industry benefactors Okay, are sowing doubt about the wildlife extinction crisis that we've talked about here on the show. We have indeed many times. Species are disappearing like crazy all well, around the world. And it's, you know, the, I, I mention this over and over again. There is a type of tick called a moose tick or a, or a winter tick. Because yeah, they get into right the here fur. in Vermont. Yeah, they get into the fur of the animal and they just stay there all winter. So they're active all winter. And I talked a couple of years ago to game officials in Vermont and New Hampshire, and um, the the woman I talked to, who is a who is a ranger, she was one of the people who went out in the field, told me that they have found that, well. First of all, a fully engorged adult female winter tick is about the size of a grape. These are big ticks. And they I've have seen pictures of uh, infected animals. They're 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 just sad, and and um, they have found moose dead, with as many as seventy thousand. That is seven zero thousand 
of these ticks on them. They've, they were bled to death. Well, the moose have never evolved a, a, a strategy to get these things off their body. Yeah. Deer roll on the ground to get rid of the ticks. The moose don't. The, the moose don't have an instinct, and the reason they don't have an instinct to remove the ticks... They never had to deal with them before. ...is because they never had to deal with them. In their evolutionary past, yeah. they, their, their geographical range never overlapped that. Right. Of and the, that's of the not tick. happening anymore. It's not happening, at least not in Vermont and New Hampshire. And uh, the, the woman in, in New Hampshire told me that a proc something upwards of 80%, that is 8-0, excuse me, eight zero percent of the moose calves bo uh, born in New Hampshire die in the wow. first year because 80 of ticks. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. This is a rapid um, uh, uh, charge toward extirpation. There's not going to be any moose in a generation. Not yeah. that there's many there now. Yeah, and, and, and um, extirpation means local extinction. I'm expecting that there will, in not very many years, be no moose in New Hampshire. And the situation in Vermont is not quite as bad, but it's bad. Not going to be much different. And the, the problem that we've got is that that kind of problem, if you consider extinction of a species is extirpation over every area. So it's like extinction in New Hampshire, extin extinction in Vermont, extinction in Maine, extinction in, in, in New York. And if you consider the extinction of a species, that's extirpation everywhere. And if we were, I was just using an example. And it runs the full, the full gamut from moose on the one end to yeah. bacteria on the and other. I was just talking about extinction, extirpation in, of moose in New Hampshire. Yeah. But that event is going to be repeated tens of millions, hundreds of millions of times across the earth when you consider species in general. This is, this is just one tiny example, moose in, in New Hampshire. Anyway. Well, what's going on here is, of course, the Republican officials and their industry benefactors are sowing doubt. Yeah. Okay? It's, it's climate deception is what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, and if you go out in the field, you find out this is doubt about things that are actually happening. Yeah. My brother is a... But it's... <laughs> they, want it, they, they, they certainly want to stop anything that's preventing them from selling oil. Yeah. Or, my, what, or coal or whatever. My brother is... is I, I'm, I'm saying this literally, a world-class tracker. I can say that because he, he, you know, he goes all over the world to lecture on tracking animals. Okay. And he tells me, he tr obviously does a lot of, he lives in Marlboro. He, he obviously does a lot of tracking in Vermont. And he tells me moose are really easy to track in the snow in Vermont because of the blood trails they leave. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. It's bad. Wow. It's bad. It's that bad. Yeah. And, and these people are denying that it's happening. <coughs> it's infuriating. Well, it's okay. all about money. It is. Basically, We're up yes. to... Friday, the 24th of May, with an article from Clean Technica. Yeah, this, this is a, an interview, and it's very interesting. It is indeed. $4,000 used plug-in hybrid and EV buyer incentive offered by Pen in Peninsula Clean Energy. In San Mateo County, California, just south of San Francisco, Pen Peninsula Clean Energy is offering a $4,000 incentive for qualifying residents who buy used plug-in hybrids and EVs. The incentive is part of a collaboration with Peninsula Family Service. Now, the thing that I find really interesting about this is the word used. This is a, yeah. this is a, an, a, an incentive for people who are financially distressed to some degree. Well, that's exactly right. That's to, exactly to get right. In, to get EVs. Because they're talking about Peninsula Family Service, which is a social service agency. Right. Similar to SEVCA or Department yep. of DSS, whatever it is, yeah. Social Security. Yeah. Uh, children and Families. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, what would you call it? It's a, a welfare. It's family service. And they talk about qualifying residents. Well, look, in order to qualify for one of these cars, you've got to be low income. Yes. They're not giving these cars away to wealthy people. Yes. Okay. And the object behind that is to get these people into cars that cost little to run so that they can have more money Absolutely. to support their families. Absolutely. It's a good program. It it's really makes sense. It's a good program. Sense. And these electric vehicles 
cost way far less to run than, than gas oh, power. Oh, definitely. Okay. And to maintain. Yeah. We have as, as I mentioned, it's an interesting <laughs> interview. Yes. Our next item is from Clean Technica. Yeah, we've and got we a have a picture up and here. the picture's already up there for, well, for you to put up. <laughs> it's up here. Here we go, by There you Joe. go, by there golly. We go. That is a May Nobility May Mobility shuttle in uh, And that's Providence, Rhode Island. Providence is the most difficult, I don't know, <laughs> it, it is the most difficult city I've ever driven through. <laughs> and, and, and the reason is because I would drive from Plymouth, Massachusetts to New Jersey and I'd go through Providence on that drive and I'd go in on Route 44 and I'd come to a place where it says Route 44 turn left. And the next intersection, it says Route 44 turn left. And at the next <laughs> intersection, it says Route 44 turn left. There is, you go around that block and there's no signs taking you anywhere except around the block. Anyway, what do you got? Providence, Rhode Island trials autonomous shuttle from May Mobility. Financed in part by money from the VW diesel cheating settlement. That's interesting. <laughs> well, they did that on purpose. A fleet of six passenger autonomous shuttles supplied by May Mobility began operating this week on a 5.3 mile fixed route that connects downtown Providence with Olneyville Square. Now, this means that there's six vehicles driving around Providence, Rhode Island that don't have drivers. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty much a direct route. Yeah. Okay, Olneyville is about five miles west of downtown. Yep. And it's, that's where all the stores are. Yeah. It's a commercial center. Yeah. So this makes a lot of sense for people who are working downtown. Yeah. Like yeah. at lunchtime, go shopping or something yeah. like that. Too. Right. So financed in part by Money Rhode Island receipt. Well, we said that. The yeah. battery, these are battery powered, they're autonomous, they're, and these vans are already being used in Detroit, Michigan, and Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Okay. So, well, final thing, they, oh, sensors, radar, and cameras are fixed to the top and sides of the vehicle. You can't really see it in that picture. I don't see it they're in the picture. They're not even there. Yeah, they might not be. <laughs> they're not even Maybe there. Maybe that's a phony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, for greater awareness and faster reactions than a human driver. Well, oh, much. We're finding that out in yeah. another generation. The car with a driver in it is going to be a rarity. Well, the car with a driver, driver in it might be banned at some point. It might very well be. Uh, yeah. They have proven that these things are safer. much safer. Yeah. Not okay. just safer, they're much safer. Our next item is from BBC. I guess it is. I guess it is. I guess it is. This is school students walk out in global climate strike. We're going to hear more about this. Oh, yeah. It's, it just keeps going on. In New Zealand, and we will have more about this in this show. In New yes. Zealand and Australia, students went on strike starting off a worldwide day of climate change protests. Organizers expect more than a million young people will, will participate in at least 110 countries, calling for politicians and businesses to take action to fight climate change. Well, of course they do. It's their problem. This is a problem of, are, are we as adults going to take care of this, or are we just well, going to leave it? we're not doing it. it. We're not, and the, <laughs> and the children... And these are the ones that are inheriting what we're yeah, doing. Which is kind of like... Okay, I want to have an opulent lifestyle, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal yours. Take a take a mortgage out on on the property that I live in, and I'm going to pass that property to my children, complete with a mortgage, and they w don't have an option of living anywhere else. Well, it's an interesting article. There's a lot of pictures in it. If you like pictures, yep. And we'll be hitting this again. We will. It does mention uh, someone we've talked about before, Greta Thunberg. Yep. And uh, she, well, we'll talk about her we later. We will indeed. She's quite a, quite a gal. She is an interesting <laughs> character. Okay, we're up to Saturday, May 25th, and we've got a oh, picture here. we've got a good here. picture here. We this do. This is a good picture. This, is <laughs> this picture tells a lot. Yeah, and the, really the caption for this picture reads, Concept einer Agrophotovoltaic <laughs> Anlage, which means the concept, this is a picture of the concept of a photovoltaic, um, and Anlage means investment, really, but it's, well, let's, it, let's it's a start talk what they about mean I'm going to bring the system. picture back, because the picture tells a, a good story. Oh, yeah, it, it does. It tells it all. Yeah. So somebody needs to tell Ohio farmers about agrophotovoltaics. Well, somebody needs to tell all farmers about I think so, yeah. agrophotovoltaics. Farmers in Ohio believe they're being forced to choose between a lifestyle they know 
and love, by the way. It's, those words aren't in this, but I'll, I'll add them. And the economic rewards of renewable energy. But the combination of farming and solar energy has been tested repeatedly. It works and it creates greater opportunities. And by the way, I will mention it's not just farming and solar energy, it's farming and wind energy, it's farming and if, if and you, both and both it's farming and biodigesters, dairy farms do that. Well, you're like doubling your income. Yeah, without and, doubling your work. Yeah, and it's <laughs> it, it's um, and the picture here shows a tractor and a cow under solar uh, panels, and that is a realistic picture. That's what they are doing in Germany with uh, experiments that are being run by Fraun. Fraunhofer. Well, it's interesting that the pictures that they're showing there is like cabbages, which yes. grow well in the shade. Yes. It, it looks like wheat, which I don't know about wheat, but uh, I guess it wouldn't be a there lot if it didn't of grow grasses, well in the shade. A lot of grasses grow just as well in partial shade that's, as they do. Yeah. You know. Well, they're not going to be able to grow corn under there. They're not going to be able to grow corn tomatoes is, under you there. You know, I grew up, <laughs> a lot of my youth was in Illinois, and corn is extremely destructive. Yes, it is. It is just especially awful. the way it's grown now. I'll tell you what you all, can all grow chemicals. under there because I I have been you know I, I'm growing these things and I've been learning about them. Um, citrus trees. A okay. lot of yeah. a lot of citrus trees will grow in the shade. Yeah, yeah. Pawpaw trees. Okay. You know, if you keep these trees down low enough so that they're not encroaching on the solar panels, which is not that difficult. If the solar panels are 12 feet up which they have to be they for those like tractors yep. and things. The, the, you, uh, do you really want to uh, gather your fruit from a tree that's more than 12 feet tall? Well, what it amounts to is there's a lot of crops that will fit this model. A lot and, of crops. Okay, you're not going to grow corn, you're not going to grow cotton, you're not going to grow tomatoes. You're, you're not going to grow anything tobacco. Else. Huh? Not tobacco. No tobacco, no. Yeah, but, but cotton, corn, and tobacco are the big three de soil destroyers. That's true. I, I That's lived in true. I lived in an agricultural yeah. community in Illinois. We learned that in second grade, maybe first grade. I don't remember. Anyway, well, I don't know how you're going to spread this idea. It's it's certainly unnatural. Yeah. I mean, you're giving a, a farmer an opportunity basically to double the income from his from his land. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Fraunhofer Institute was was showing that pretty well. They're they're showing uh, a slight. They're showing the incre the income from the solar panels plus income from a slightly increased crop on the land because the crop is increased because of the shade. Well, helping. the article says it increased by sixty percent. Yeah, the yeah, pretty decent. Yeah, <laughs> the, the crop wasn't increased, but the the total the total was, income total income was increased by sixty percent, and there is no increase in work to do that. Most farmers would appreciate that. Well, you know, there's traditional yeah. practices in farming. Yes. You know, my daddy did it this way. I'm going to do it this way. Well, it's not and, just farming. It's huh? everything. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's a lot of that. But particularly farmers, they're traditional. Yep. And it's going to take a while for this concept to break through. Oh, I think, when you know, people, farmers... Look, money are, talks. Farmers are practical <laughs> people, if nothing else. Okay, and, and also... This means they get an income even in the lean years. If there's a drought, if there's a, play, a pestilence of some kind, they get They're their they get, sunlight. Yep. They get a, a, an income. Okay, our next item is from Think Progress, and this is one that I... Well, this is kind of scary. I've been infuriated by this for quite a while, but go ahead. The bus wars are over. Electricity and China won. The bus wars are over and electricity won thanks to a big boost from China with China's massive investment in and support for electric buses. Electrics are now racing past a 50% share of new bus sales worldwide. That's amazing. Well, uh, they're, they're making all of these things. According to a recent analysis by Bloomberg NEF, now Bloomberg is not a slouch organization and they're not a, they're not a mouthpiece for some some no, they're pretty pretty accurate they're, and they're, what this article is saying is that 50 percent of the buses worldwide are electric and how many of them are in the united states well you know what's happening china's looking at the overall cost of owning those and operating those buses yeah well, we're just looking at the cost of buying them oh it, it, which is a this is the traditional way that third world countries have kept themselves poor 
is the way that the United States is <laughs> is, is operating. Yeah. And you know, I look at the cost of the bus. We say, oh my goodness, you know, but yeah. over court, the lifetime of a bus, it, it's, they're running like forty percent cost. You and I, Tom, grew up in a time when China was a place where people went out and wandered around rice paddies every day. Yeah. It was a third world country. Not anymore. I can remember when the Chinese Navy had something like 700 ships in it. One cruiser, three destroyers, and that totals four, <laughs> and almost 700 junks. Wow. <laughs> now, what is it today? Well, they got battleships now. Well, not Cruisers. Battle. They have cruisers. Heavy cruisers. Heavy cruisers, which would absolutely destroy a World War II class battleship. Oh, definitely. And in fact, they've got, you know, Today, there was a thing about, about the destroyer called the John S. McCain. Yeah. And Donald Trump is visiting uh, Japan, and so the, the White House told the Navy they want the, the McCain out of sight. No for, kidding. For, for Trump, yeah. And Why is that? Because Trump doesn't like McCain. Oh, okay. <laughs> Duh. Why did I think of that? And, and you know, I mean, this is a, it, it, it just shows you We've got great power behind a person who's acting very childishly. Yeah. And here, what we've got is, I don't know. Well, quick takeaway. Yeah. China has 420,000 electric buses. The United States has 300. I don't think that figure is actually correct. Well, you got, you got an update. No, it's not an update. I, I think there may have been a digit dropped or something because we're manufacturing, about, we're manufacturing a little over 1,000 a year. I did a research project uh -huh. on this about, about a year and a half ago. We had about 1,000 buses at that time, and we were making them at a rate of So about, maybe we should have 3,000. Yes. It's still 3,000 versus 421,000. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of electric bus manufacturers in the United States. GM and Ford appear, appear not to be interested. But there's, uh, there's a couple of um, startup companies that make electric buses. But the big company making electric buses in the United States just opened its factory. It's and Chinese. Who is that? I bet you could guess. It's on the tip of my tongue. We've already talked about it on this show. BYD. Yeah, right. Build your dreams. Right? Yeah, build your dreams. The, <laughs> the biggest uh, company making electric buses in the United States is Chinese. <laughs> We have got, a, it's a $50 billion a year uh, industry, and the United States doesn't even have its toe in the water. Well, here's a, here's a quick takeaway. Diesel buses emit staggering amounts of urban air pollution. They routinely break down, and they need major repairs. Nothing can compete with electricity for the highest efficiency and performance, along with lowest emissions and lifetime costs, including fuel and maintenance. Yeah. Everything that has an urban drive cycle will ultimately be an electric vehicle. Or, yes. That's true. That's that, a, that's I have no state. doubt that that's true. They're and gonna, it isn't going to take very long. Yeah. Okay. Um, we got a good picture. Our next, uh, our next item is from Clean Technica, and this is a GRACE satellite system. The photograph came from NASA. Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. That's what GRACE stands for. Yep. And there's a couple of pictures of, well, they operate in pairs, but yeah. we're going to probably tell us about it. You got a title? For nearly 20 years, GRACE has helped us understand climate change. In 2002, two satellites designed to take detailed measurements of the Earth were put into space. They provided detailed daily information on climate change for 15 years. Now, the GRACE follow-on mission has been launched successfully, despite the fact that Donald Trump is in the White House. Oh, those were my words added to well, this. Well, we'll be talking about exactly that. To take their place, and this is from Clean Technica. And I want to point out, the way these GRACE satellites work, they're measuring gravity, which means yes. they're measuring the mass of the ice on the on this on the ice caps it translates to that doesn't it yes it does yes. and and you know the, the, we've got uh, and uh, we've got abilities to do things with satellites that are just astonishing and well they're able to find out get a pretty good cl clear picture of how the planet's climate patterns are behaving yeah Okay, and there are certain powers that be that don't want this to, to, to get you know, out. I mean, I mean, it's becoming more and more clear that the White House is trying to prevent us from seeing what's happening. Bingo. Bingo. That's exactly right. And we'll talk about that. And, yeah. 
Okay, we're up to Sunday, May 26th. Already? With another, <laughs> uh, well, we're actually behind schedule here, um, with another item from Clean Technica. Skyrocketing Tesla sales forced Mercedes dealer in Norway to face a Kodak moment. Oh, man. <laughs> With the Tesla Model 3 available in Norway since February, sales of competing brands have suffered. Mercedes deal dealer Bertel Osteen has, I don't think that's an Irish name. I think it No, was, it's Bertel O. <laughs> o is his, like Oscar. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Has there's seen no it, apostrophe there. There's no apostrophe there. Well, it's Norway, not Ireland, but you never can tell with these. <laughs> Has seen its passenger car sales drop a full 33% in the first four months. That's enough to kill a company, you know? Well, it's not helping Mercedes in Norway at all. No, and not at all. And we talked about this on the show But, already. you know, they're, they're looking into what are they going to do about this, and what they have to do about it is start carrying electric cars. Well, Norwegian car sales have increased by 4%. Okay, yeah. that's normal. But there's been a large shift away from gas and diesel toward electric. Yes. As we've also mentioned on this show. Yes. The Model 3 is far and away the top selling car in Norway in 2019. Yeah. And we're seeing that thing repeated over and over and over among the statistics. And it's interesting to see that the Wall Street Journal, you know, big companies like that are saying, don't pay attention to that <laughs> company behind the screen over there. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Okay. Our next item is from Clean Technica. Yeah, and we, we have a picture, picture here of two little here. girls. There we go. Dealing with a with charging a car. <laughs> what do you, what do you, <laughs> it actually says that. Yeah. It Charge does. Point and Chevron partner to bring more fast charging to more gas stations. This is interesting because it's Chevron. And and Chevron later on in in the week was doing the same thing with a different organization well, a different station. What they're doing here at Charge Point does uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. Right. Chevron has the gas stations. Right. So they're putting these things in in Chevron gas stations yes, all over. Absolutely. Certainly, certain big, very heavily traveled route in California. Let me read this. Charge Point and Chevron partnered on DC fast charging stations along Interstate 5 in California to fill in key gaps in universal fast charging coverage. A California Energy Commission program will see 70 charge port charging stations in, installed. And it's only part of several programs going on out there. Yeah, there's a bunch. A little yeah. takeaway here. Charging an EV is so easy a kid or two can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Little girls. I wonder how And it is. I mean, you know. Yeah. Just plug it in. Yeah. That's a clean Technica car, but I, I don't think those little kids are, are Zach Shahan's. I'm not sure. You don't think what? They're Zach, Zach Shahan is the editor of Clean Technica, oh. and that's a Clean Technica car. And I don't know if Zach Shahan has, has kids, but kids show up in his photographs fairly often. That photograph is from Zach Shahan. Okay. That's a good Norwegian name. <laughs> okay, we're up to Monday, May 27th, and um, we have... Oh, well, we skipped one here. Did we? Yeah. Oh, we, we did indeed. I'm sorry. This is from the Mayfield Recorder. It is that. Coal's U.S. slide to continue as renewables and gas fill the gap. Now, well, we've talked about this before. Yeah. Command, demand for coal to generate electricity will continue to slide in coming, coming months despite Trump administration efforts to shore up the industry, the EIA said. Renewable energy, including wind, solar, and hydropower, is expected to fill much of the gap left by coal's decline. Now, the the larger part of of electric generating capacity installed last year was natural gas but they had a huge amount of natural gas on the books to be be installed and and that has declined very significantly for the next the installations that are coming up over the next two years. So it will be renewables that are filling much of this. Well, what it's saying here is after production briefly bumped up after Trump took office, almost all coal mining states are now experiencing production declines. Yep. In western states, renewables will provide almost a quarter of the power during the peak summer season yep. coming up. And natural gas is expected to remain the fuel of choice for power de generation. And it the takeaway here, the decline is relentless. Yes, the decline is relentless, and it's going to go on. Okay, we're up to Monday, May 27th, and, and we've, we've got, got a an, picture here. We have a picture and an item from Clean Technica. 
Nickel Ride. This is an interesting article. This is the article I was yeah, talking very about. Short three, one. Three Nickel paragraphs. Ride finds EVs are so affordable they can give rides away for free. This is a ride. It's it's like a taxi. You yeah. call the taxi, it shows up, it takes you where you want That's to go, exactly and, it's, what it is. and it's free. <laughs> Nickel Ride, which operates in some Florida cities, found a way to use the advantages of, of electric vehicles for a competitive edge. Customers can download a Nickel Ride app to request free rides. The company uses advertising revenue to pay for the drivers in the cars. You know, as you can see by the picture, that's exactly what the driving billboards. Yeah, I, I don't have a car. Yeah. So I, if I'm going to go to Walmart, which is four miles out, I've got three choices. I can walk four yeah. miles each way, yeah. total of eight miles, which is a fairly long walk. I can ride a bicycle. Yeah. Or I can take a bus. But if I take a bus. The bus that takes me there then goes to Hinsdale, comes back. <laughs> Half an hour after it drops me off, it is going back to Brattleboro, and it's not going to be back in the going to Brattleboro direction for two hours. So, you, so I've you got a gotta, choice. You've got to do that shopping quickly. Yeah, I could take a cab, but you know, the, I've got a choice of 30 minutes or two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah. So what I did was I called up Walmart and I said, take a look at this. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did indeed. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder if they're going to per pursue that. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, what it says here, free, on-demand, electric rides. It's not too good to be true. It's just <laughs> the best idea on four wheels. Uh, I'll go with that. <laughs> okay, our next item is from The Guardian. Ah, this is an interesting article, too. This is about politics. It is indeed. Greens surge as parties make strongest ever showing across Europe. Green parties have swept to their strongest ever showing in European elections, boosting their uh, tally of, of members of European Parliament, this is MEPs, to a projected 71 compared to 52 last time. The result gives them every chance of becoming kingmakers in a newly fragmented parliament. Well, this is kind of weird because what exactly is the European Parliament? Well, it's you got a bunch of independent countries you that do. have agreed to agree. Yes, okay. but but the European Parliament has got a fair amount of power. Well, what it says, it's a cons consultative assembly with indirect influence. Yeah. That doesn't mean no power. Yeah, they oh, they can only make non-binding resolutions. Yes. Okay, but this is a quote from the article. This is a mandate for real change, for climate protection, more democracy, and a people of law. They have the power of moral suasion. Yep, and people are noticing. And you know, Andrea Merkel commented on this and said, "We're not doing enough." You know, it's clear that people want us to do more. Well, I did because I was confused about this. I looked up a little bit about the European Parliament. Yeah, and it has been getting gradually more and more powerful each year. Yeah. Okay, so eventually, if this trend continues, it will be the ruling of it has, authority. It has a lot of power. It's you got know, a lot of influence. Ireland, for example, is way behind in its, in its achieving its renewable energy goals for mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. And if they don't achieve that, those goals, they're going to owe millions of dollars every year to the European Parliament until they can catch up. Or the European so they Commission. got um, monetary it's, power. They have a certain amount yeah. of monetary power. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting okay. to see how it works. Our next item is from Renewal Economy. And we got a picture here. We have a picture of a pump jack. We've seen this before. We have. And, or <laughs> Maybe this exact picture. It might be actually. <laughs> or that is what is called a nodding donkey. <laughs> yep. Yep. What nodding you, donkey. What do you got for a title? Oil and gas majors could lead Australian renewables development by 2020. Analysis now, by this, this is the gas company. That's right. <laughs> Analysis by independent oil and gas consultancy Rystad Energy says renewable energy investments in Australia will overtake spending on upstream oil and gas projects as early as next year in a shift that is led by the oil and gas industry itself. Well, I think what's happening is the oil and gas industry is reading the writing on the wall. That's and was saying, exactly you know, what I was saying. If we're going to keep money in our pockets, we're going to have to get on we board. We have to react to this. And they're buying up the uh, renewables. Yep, that's right. We are up to Tuesday, May 28th, with an item from Forbes. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Aha. <laughs> I lost my track. I was. You want to me to read the title? I can do no, it. I've got the title. Oh, okay. I was just thinking about what I was going to say the last time, but we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll pass on All to right. that. This Swedish clean tech company wants to mass produce printable organic solar cells. Now, we've mentioned this before. We this have. is very interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, Epishine, a, a Swedish clean tech company, has a solar technology that would make it possible to manufacture photovoltaics on machines the size of newspaper presses, each printing solar cells at a rate equivalent to one nuclear reactor every month. Well, think about this now. I mean, these solar panels now, what are they? Two feet by three feet? They're bigger than that. Glass, right? two feet by four feet, glass, yeah. metal, yeah. heavy. Yeah. And these guys are just pumping them out like you print yeah. a newspaper. There's one thing about this that I find a little bit iffy, and that is these solar cells are not going to last very long compared to those those glass ones that you just mentioned could last 50 or 100 years. But these things... Yeah, but they're not going to keep up with the technology in 50 or 100 yeah, years. They might or might not. They probably you know, won't. I should say they won't keep up with the technology, but they might or may not be valuable in 50 years. It's hard to know. Not to the original purchasers, but they'll still have a value. Well, they will have a value, but it may be that the, the newer technologies that come along will be so much more efficient that it will be... Uh, For the uh, big users, yeah. yeah. But the little guys like you are going to be able to pick up the old panels cheap. Okay. Now we have uh -huh. a picture of a young woman who is a world leader. Uh, and there she is. There she is. She, she is... This, <laughs> she looks so tiny. <laughs> Okay, this is she's from, 16. She looks like she's eight. Yeah, and she's doing a heck of a lot of very important this work. This is an imp this is an important person. She oh, is absolutely. A, she is a world leader. There is no question of this. She was the th the person who motivated a million kids to skip school. Well, she's already been nominated for the Nobel Peace and Prize. I, it wouldn't surprise me if she didn't get it. Actually, at this point, it will surprise me if she doesn't get it. <laughs> but this is from Clean Technica. What do you got? This for Swedish. Title? Oh, we just... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was the last one. That was the last one. As young people lead on climate change, adults must step up. On Friday, May 24th, over a million young people gathered in some 1,600 locations in 125 countries to plead for effective action on climate change. Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old who inspired them, made the appeal, quote, We ask you adults, give us a future, end quote. This is her full, her full quote. We are facing a, an existential crisis. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right words, guys. Uh, what does that mean? It means either we're going to live or we're going to die. We need to see changes in all levels of society. Yes. We are in an emergency situation, but we are not behaving like that. We know that you love your children above all else, but right now that does not work. Yeah. And a little bit later on in this article, they brought up Bill McKibben. Yes. Who's a local guy. Yeah. And, uh, well, there's a whole, uh, how would I say it, an interview with him yeah. that's worth reading. Yes. I'll read just one sentence. Go ahead. McKibben issued a call Friday, which was when, last Friday, for people of all ages to join in a one-day global strike on September 20th. That's going to happen, guys. That's yes. going to happen. Yes. What all these people have in common is a strong sense that business as usual has become the problem, that it needs to be interrupted if only for a day. The iron law of climate change is that the less you did to cause it, the more you suffer from it. Well, that's one, uh, one iron law, but there's another iron law, and that is it is real, it is happening, it is dangerous, and if you don't do anything about it, it will do something about you. Be good so, if we could get McKibben on a show here. It would be nice. He's I think he's kind of busy. Yeah, he's, he's kind of busy. He's kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> he's doing good work, though. Yeah, he is. Okay. Just came out with a new book, too. What's that? Uh, it's called. Oh, I saw it in everyone's books. Er, I, 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 the, the words on the tip of oh, my tongue. I by got a copy way, of it already. For anybody who's interested, the books that I've got that I just showed yeah. of mine, you can get them at everyone's books. You can books. get them in, a, in softbound at everyone's books. You can get them hardbound at Ar um, Artrageous, which is just up the street from everyone's books, both on Elliott Street. Oh, good. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. Yeah, I don't have a picture to go up with it, but that's no? okay. I'm going to put us up there. <laughs> there you go. Okay, just for kicks. With DHL. 
and street scooter trial hydrogen fuel cell fuel cell powered delivery vans. Now, street scooter is not a scooter company. No, it's an electric vehicle manufacturer yeah. located in Aachen, Germany. Yeah. You didn't think I knew that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not surprised you did. Well, for another another, <clears throat> another enlightenment here, DHL is an American-founded German international courier, parcel, and express mail delivery company. Yes. Which, interestingly enough, is owned by the German post office, which, interestingly enough, is privately owned. <laughs> 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 don't don't push that one because these guys in Washington will try to make it privately owned oh, in the United States and then it'll fall apart. Way back in in Franklin's time, they were calling him a communist and communism hadn't even been invented. <laughs> <laughs> the word hadn't been invented and they were using it. Okay, DHL and Street Scooter have been pioneers in zero emission de uh, delivery vans, originally intended for DHL's own use. The street scooter concept was so popular, a second factory is under construction to serve the demands of third-party customers. Well, it's an electric van, okay? Yep. And they have found out <coughs> that that was not quite adequate enough for some of their longer routes, so they put them on board a hydrogen bottle. <laughs> and a hydrogen bottle is using a fuel cell to recharge the batteries. There you so go. they can get 300 miles. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, street. we're up to Wednesday, May 29th, Yeah. and we have a picture We do that. Let's, of a, so a coal-fired power plant in Utah. That's Huntington Canyon Yep. In, U in Utah. Oh, this is an interesting article. It is. Trump administration hardens his attack on climate science. Why would they do that? Why? Donald Trump and his political appointees are launching a new assault. Parts of the federal government will no longer fulfill what scientists say is one of the most urgent jobs of climate science studies, reporting on the future effects of a rapidly warming planet. You can bet your bottom dollar there's going to be a lawsuit over this. And it's I going, think there is already. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> th what they're doing is they're telling the people who have been mandated by Congress to do the report how to do how the to report. Do it, right. and, the, and the specific thing that they're doing is they're saying, you're not allowed to look more than a certain number of years into the future. And the number 40, of years, I think it is. Yeah, and the number of years is like 20 years. You're not yeah. allowed to look more yeah. than 20 years down the line. And, and, and the really bad news is longer than 20 years. A lot of it yeah. is. And yeah. Basically, so whatever you do, don't let those children get too excited. <laughs> is basically what they're saying. And don't let anybody who's related to them know what's really going on. This is a matter of hold your eyes shut, or if you aren't going to do that, we're going to hold them shut for you. Well, this came from the New York Times. Yes. It's a long article. There's a lot of pictures in it, and it's a very good article. It'll take you a while to read it, but uh, there's a lot of meat in it. And it's all about basically trying to sow doubt into climate change. Right. Did I read the body of this thing? I don't think you did. Donald Trump and his political appointees are launching a new assault. Parts of the federal government, I read, did read this, will no longer fulfill what scientists say is the most urgent job of the climate studies, reporting the effects of a ra rapidly yeah. warming climate. I did read that. Well, you haven't heard anything by reading it twice. Yeah, I don't think so. We've got an article coming up now from Energy Matters. Aha. Uh -huh. Australia on track to reach 50% renewable <laughs> energy by 2030. This is so funny. This is from Reputex. Uh, the, the data is from Reputex. Oh, the article you got it from Energy Matters. Energy but Matters, but the data is from Rep the, rep the report at the core of the thing is from Reputex. Australia is on, tra on track to achieve a 50% renewable energy, um, electric energy target. The article didn't say en electric energy. I inserted the word electric here because it is electric it is energy electric. they're talking yep. about. And when you start talking about energy properly, you're talking about oil, gas, nuclear, whatever. Um, Regardless, uh, the, uh, Australia is on track to achieve 50% by 2030, regardless of federal policy intervention. This is due to the country meeting state renewable energy targets. That's the finding of new modeling by energy analyst firm Reputex. Well, they're going to get there without any help from the federal government. Well, what's happening in one case, in the case of these two west, two eastern states, yeah. is 
the people are doing it themselves. Yes. Uh, record growth in solar and wind speeds decline in coal. Yeah. Okay. That's and right. coal is big in Australia. Or it but, has been. Well, t <coughs> it's a big economic factor. Yeah. In, in you know what's amazing to me? In Queensland, a third of all the houses have solar panels on the roof. Yeah. Queensland. Privately, they did it themselves. Queensland voted in this last election only a few days ago very heavily in favor of the Liberal government, yeah. which is the, the Australian equivalent of conservative Conserv republics. Wh wh which is very big on coal. Well, they want and, to build a huge why? coal mine. Because they want to build a huge coal mine. <laughs> because it'll employ 5,000 people, and 5,000 is a lot of people in Australia. It would be like employing 50,000 people in the United States. Yeah, probably. So, um, but but the the states in Australia, every every state in Australia wants to keep its the its um, prices for energy low, and how do they do that? Well, by abandoning coal. Well, what it, what the article says, and we've talked about this here: installations of rooftop solar power are at record-breaking levels. Yes, and it's all being done privately. Yes, and are forecast to contribute half the renewable capacity needed for the. Uh, national electricity market to reach its target. So despite what the government is doing, the people are taking it into their own hands individually. We were talking about stranded assets. Yeah. This, this coal mine that they've one. coming up is going to be a big, a stranded, big stranded asset. asset. And you know what? I think that they might, might hire 5,000 people and then three or four years down the line say, sorry gang, got to go back home. You're not going to have jobs here anymore. And what's that going to do? If there's no it? money to be made in, in mining coal, They're nobody's not. going to mine coal. That's right. Well, we got a nice picture coming up here. We do indeed. This, this, this is, is this kind is, of a surprising This is picture. an interesting interesting truck. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is from Clean Technica. It's a self-driving truck. And if you look at those lights up over the cab, they're not lights. Yes. They're cameras. <laughs> okay. And other sensors. Man, there's a couple of lights up there, but yeah. they're mostly cameras. Yeah. Okay, UP, USPS, the Postal Service, goes driverless between Phoenix and Dallas. Now, that's a thousand miles. Yes. That's, that's a significant. Yep. Now, wait, and wait, the company wait, wait, wait. here is called Too Simple, T-U-S-I-M-P-L-E. Yeah, that's <laughs> the U.S. Postal Service has entered into a contract with self-driving truck startup Too Simple to haul mail between Dallas and Phoenix. Too Simple will complete five round-trip routes over the next two weeks while a safety engineer and a licensed driver ride along in the cab playing pinochle as they go down the road. <laughs> so right now this is a pilot program. This is a pilot program. But, but look, it's a thousand miles. You know, one man, one woman, one person isn't going to likely do that one day. They're They'll probably try. not even going to be allowed. They're, they wouldn't be allowed to, but they will try. You know, I've known truck drivers. Yeah, they carry two sets of books. They, they, they are very creative about trying <laughs> to get 20 hours of work in each day. Yeah. That way they can work two days a week and take the rest of the, you know, it'll give them five days to go fishing. Well, but, this thing without a driver, 1,000 miles? It just goes. It just goes. It'll just go. And you know, Tom, I, I have to tell you, I find the whole idea of a world in which there are vehicles going around at 70 miles an hour with nobody in them a little which bit scary. Gonna it's going to happen, but I find, honestly. Well, you and I, but uh, science says these things are safer. It does indeed, and I believe that's correct, and it, it doesn't prevent me from being a little bit happy. <laughs> you know, well, I, from, from I, the article here, yeah. before many people will ride in a robo-taxi, their mail and packages will be carried in a self-driving truck. Yeah. Probably very true. Yeah. And this particular self-driving system uses eight cameras, which I'm going to bring the picture up, Yeah. to detect cars, pedestrians, and other obstacles up to a third of a mile away, even in inclement weather. Yes. And by keeping aware of the traffic flow ahead, the trucks are able to maintain a given speed more consistently than human drivers, cutting fuel consumption by as much as 15%. Yep. And of course, there's no time constraints. They just go. We, however, have a time constraint, which yeah, is at the end of the show left. is here. <laughs> and so I'm going to put this thing up saying, have a perfectly lovely and week. You're going to be both and up we will here. Co come up and say, and please say come goodbye. back next time. Have a beautiful week. You'll come back now, yeah? Yeah, that's right.